Thank you very much. Thanks for coming this evening. Uh, I'm Hank Levy, Chair of UW Computer Science and Engineering. I'd like to welcome you to the final presentation in the 2015 Engineering Lecture Series, which was titled Robots to Web Trackers, Privacy in the Age of Smart Technology. This series is presented in partnership with the College of Engineering and the UW Alumni Association. If you're not a member, I encourage you to visit UWAA online at uwalum.com to learn more about membership. As we learn throughout this fall series, Technology moves at a dizzying rate. One of the challenges with this advancement is that in the rush to market, security and privacy are often left behind. In addition, understanding the policy implications of new technology is a separate challenge in itself. As one example, take Google Glass and other wearable cameras. What happens if somebody wears these devices in a private or sensitive place? How can they be controlled? Who makes the rules? Overall, what are the privacy and policy implications for technologists, for companies, and for government? Our speakers tonight are co-director of the UW's Technology Policy Lab, which is looking at questions around responsible technology innovation. The lab is an interdisciplinary collaboration to inform technology policy in areas that include robotics, the internet, and education, and other things. It seeks to provide lawmakers and other policymakers with recommendations for decision making around new and developing technologies. I'd like to introduce our panel to start. On your right is Ryan Kello, a professor at the UW School of Law, where his research is on law and emerging technologies. He has testified before the Judiciary Committee of the US Senate, spoken at the Aspen Ideas Festival, and to NPR's weekend in Washington. In 2014, he was named one of the most important people in robotics by Business Insider. Ryan is an affiliate scholar at the Stanford Law School Center for Internet and Society, where he was a research fellow, and he serves on numerous advisory boards, including the Electronic Frontier Foundation and the Future of Privacy Forum. Next to him is Bacha Friedman, a professor in the UW Information School, the iSchool, where she pioneered the concept of value-sensitive design, an approach that accounts for human values in the design of technology and information systems. For example, she has focused on issues such as public privacy, trust, freedom from bias, safety, freedom of expression, and human dignity. Bacha applied this approach to technologies such as web browsers, robotics, open source tools, mobile computing, implantable medical devices, computer security, and ubiquitous computing. And on this side is Yoshi Kono, who is the short Dooley Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at UW. He's director of the CSE Security and Privacy Research Lab. Yoshi is an expert in a broad range of security topics, from cryptography to software design, with a special interest in computer security and privacy for emerging and consumer technologies. Yoshi's, Yoshi's research demonstrating the security weaknesses in modern automobiles has been featured on 60 Minutes, on PBS, PBS Nova, and he was personally featured in an episode of PBS Nova's Science Now called Can Science Stop Crime? So the way we're going to do this is uh, each of our panelists is going to make a short statement. Um, we'll have a panel discussion, and then we'll, in the end, open for audience questions. Uh, we'll start with Yoshi. Hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hank. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you all very much for being here. Uh, as Hank said, my name is Yoshi Kono, and my research area is computer security and privacy. And together with Batya and Ryan, I help run and create the UW Tech Policy Lab. Uh, we all prepared our introductory remarks separately. Uh, and from my perspective, I want to stress that the lab really builds on the strengths of the different departments. So for example, the Information School, which Batya represents, the School of Law, which Ryan represents, and also Computer Science and Engineering. And of course, all the wonderful members that make up these different departments and different units, and the students that actually help us succeed with our work. Uh, for my opening remarks, I want to tell you a little bit about the technical work we do in computer science and engineering, focusing on computer security and uh, for the theme of this, uh, of this series on privacy. And to do this, I want to begin a little bit with my view of the future. So first, as a computer scientist and a technologist, I believe that technology is a really a game changer. With technology, we can improve many aspects of our lives, from education to healthcare to work productivity and to leisure and so on. And so all this is great, but the question as a computer security researcher I ask is, are there any potential downsides with these new technologies? You know, what bad things might happen if we throw a hacker into the mix? You know, maybe this hacker is really ma malicious or maybe just mischievous, 
but they have the potential to turn these wonderful new technologies upside down. For example, identity theft has been an, an issue for a very long time. Technology has just made that easier. So the technical goal that we do in computer science and engineering is we try to say what might the hot new technologies be over the next 5, 10, or 15 years, and how can we anticipate what the computer security and privacy risks might be, and then can we proactively develop mechanisms to mitigate those risks before they actually manifest. As I like to say, I really want to have our cake and eat it too, and by this I mean we want to have the benefits of these wonderful new technologies without the associated security and privacy downsides. The way we do our research in the computer security lab uh, at the University of Washington, I know you already met one of the lab co-directors, Francie Rosner, uh, at an earlier uh, seminar in this, uh, this fall. Uh, we have three main approaches to the work that we do. The first approach is we try to understand what are the risks with today's technologies. We get an artifact of today's technologies and we analyze it and figure out what might a bad, an adversary be able to do. And that helps us become informed of what the potential future risks might be and help us figure out how to develop defenses. The other thing that we try to do is we try to measure adversarial activity that's happening all out there in the world today. What is actually happening today with our privacy? And the third thing we try to do is we try to develop mechanisms to improve our security and privacy, new defensive techniques. So I'll very briefly give you examples from each of these categories. On the first category, analyzing and finding vulnerabilities with existing technologies. Uh, maybe five, ten years or so ago now, we bought a bunch of wireless children's toys. These are toys that are marketed for children with wireless capabilities. They also have a webcam in them. Advertising was that you buy this and keep it in your house, and when you're at your friend's house, connect over the internet to your wireless toy and make sure your parents aren't in your room. Uh, unfortunately, we found that these were very vulnerable, uh, and that an unauthorized party somewhere else on the internet could connect to these wireless uh, toys in the child's bedroom and, and view the, the webcam speed. We also bought a modern car, a 2000 edition modern sedan. Uh, we subjected to a large number of uh, an analyses. On the privacy side, I'll just give you one example of our, our final results. Our car has a built-in telematics unit, you can think of it like OnStar, that had the ability to call 911 if the car gets into an accident. Our car has a cell phone, that means that we are able to call our car's phone number with a regular old, old telephone. Once we call our car's phone number, we found some vulnerabilities. We play an appropriate tone to switch to the in-band modem, play some more modem tones to bypass an authentication vulnerability, play some more tones to exploit a buffer overflow vulnerability. The net result of this is that we have our own software running on the car's computer. Uh, if you know computer science, the car's telematics unit has a version of Unix, had FTP installed. Uh, we just open up an FTP connection to our server at the University of Washington, download more code, that if a computer scientist, that code is an IRC client, our car connects to our, our IRC command and control channel at the University of Washington, we have an automotive botnet. Uh, from that point, uh, and this is a collaboration with UCSD, uh, our car has Bluetooth hands-free calling, and what that means is that we can turn on the in-cabin microphones within the car and stream real-time audio over the car's built-in cellular communication to, to us or anywhere on the internet uh, without any visual indicators inside the car. So an example of a privacy risk with current technologies. An example of a measurement activity. Uh, back then, five, ten years or so ago, we heard rumors that ISPs were injecting advertisements into your web traffic. You go to google.com and you see a banner ad that's injected. That banner ad might have come from an ISP and not Google. So what we did is we created an infrastructure about a web, our, at our servers at UW, a web page that when it's sent to a web browser, would self-inspect the page to see if an ISP was injecting ads. Uh, we had this page, this page was slash dotted, 50,000 people from around the world visited our web page, and from that we got to see a map of what different ISPs were doing to your web traffic. Uh, you know, and they have the, obviously have the ability to observe your traffic, the privacy implication. Uh, this is an example of a measurement activity. And then finally on the topic of building things, uh, maybe one question might ask is, how would you feel if all your Google searches over the history of time suddenly became public? You know, how would you feel about that? Uh, what would, how would you feel if your emails, maybe emails from even 10 years or so ago, uh, were also suddenly became public? Uh, together with Hank Levy uh, and Roxana and Arvind Krishnamurthy, some other people at UW, we explored the question of how can we create systems out there that would allow our data to disappear over time? 
You know, the technical details are somewhat complicated, but we thought it was an important problem and it's a problem we needed to address. These are, of course, all issues that we think about from a technical perspective, uh, but one of the things that I firmly believe is that technology does not exist in isolation. You know, technology exists in the broader ecosystem of people, policy, law, and so on. And so while I focused those opening remarks on the technical aspects of computer security and privacy, I think that the UW Tech Policy Lab and its, and its, and its perspective of the law and society and so on is fundamentally important, uh, and which is why we created the Tech Policy Lab, um, which is why I'm handing it over uh, to the next speaker. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. Great. Wow. Um, one of my great joys in being able to um, work with other departments is that you see like how other people approach problems and it's really different, right? It's really different. What Yoshi does and what Batya do are really different from what me and my colleagues do, right? So I'm a law professor um, and uh, I look specifically at um, the effect of uh, emerging technologies on existing law and legal institutions and one of those is robotics. Um, but I also work heavily in the area of privacy and my work there is a little more theoretical. And so in privacy, what I focus on is what is the nature of privacy harm? How is privacy harm different than another kind of harm? A harm to your dignity, a physical harm like a burn. What's unique about privacy harm? Um, and, so, and then in turn I ask, is the law the right place to address that harm? So if you, if you think about Yoshi's first example of one of the things that his lab looked at, he actually calls them toys, but he looked at household robots. The name of the paper uses the term household robots. And these are these like, you know, little humanoid robots that you know, can drive around and you can control them and so forth. And you know, as we might understand, like robotics is, is more and more common. Uh, uh, it's really leaving factories and leaving the theater of war and entering into our, our homes. Um, and so what they looked at was the security issues with these robots. They found, you know, um, uh, Yoshi's work is so interesting that I'm going to use part of my time to continue to talk about <laughs> Yoshi's work. Um, one of the things that he and his students found uh, was that you could also physically take over the robot and do tasks in the house with the manipulators, which I thought was a neat detail. Um, so the law has ways of ad addressing inadequate security in a robot or inadequate security in a car. So for example, the Federal Trade Commission could step in and say, look, your security for this robot is inadequate, and we're going to throw the book at you. We're going to fine you and whatever it happens to be, right? Or the law could allow you to sue over security. That's the kind of thing that actually we have redressed. If a person other than Yoshi were to hack into a system to do something malicious, well, we have laws, laws against that, right? But consider another dimension to the kind of privacy harm that may occur from a robot in your home. Robots are, almost by definition, heavily anthropomorphic. And it turns out that there is a deep social science literature that suggests that we react to anthropomorphic technology as though a person were really there, right? Um, the, I mean, the, the studies are fascinating. They, they say things like, for instance, um, uh, uh, folks will pay for coffee more often on the honor system if you put a picture of eyes over the coffee collection basket than, than flowers, right? Um, people, will, people will give more in charity games, um, if you, uh, games where, you, where, you, where the exercise involves you know, charitable giving and you get to take home what you, don't, what you don't give, people will give more in those games if you put a, a robot next to them in the room so that the robot doesn't think you're a cheapskate, right? <laughs> um, so one of the things we're experiencing today is that there's a lot of anthropomorphic interfaces, right? There's Amazon Echo that you talk to, there's Siri, you know, my, my son who's five has already figured out that he can, he can get um, my phone to do things like, you know, he's always saying things like, um, hey, you know, okay, Google, and I'm like, Doo -doo, and he's like, show me Legos and pirates, you know what I mean? And it'll, it'll show it to him, and he understands that, right? He's growing up in that, in that culture. But if you react, if you're hardwired to react physiologically to a social technology as though a person were really there, what are your opportunities for solitude? When are you ever alone? When do you ever get those, what Alan Weston calls those moments off stage? If in your car, in your phone, in your home, right, there is something that feels to you like a person. And that's not something that the law is going to be able to address particularly well, right? So, 
you know, I'm very interested in the full range of, of issues that these things come up. Um, and as a consequence, I find myself, like Bhatia and like Yoshi, consistently turning to other disciplines for the answers that my own discipline is not able to furnish, right? Um, and so now, one of my joys, uh, uh, apart from hearing how sort of the other side lives, is that I feel much more confident in my ability to tackle contemporary complicated problems because I have the folks that actually do that other work uh, available to work with me. So um, and with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to the next director. So that's me. <laughs> um, so I'm uh, Batya Friedman. I'm on the faculty of the iSchool and engaged in longstanding conversations with um, Ryan and Yoshi on a whole range of topics around these emerging technologies and their um, impacts on society. And in addition, for a very long time, I've also directed the Value Sensitive Design Research Lab here at UW, where we've been looking at how do you actually, from a design point of view, from a technical point of view, foreground human values in your design process. So that's some of the lens that I um, bring to this. And of course, um, we deal with privacy and security and um, many other values as well when we do that. So I want to add to um, the conversation that we've started here just four observations. Um, one thing is, you know, what work does privacy do for us? Like, why do we even care about it? What's, it, what's at stake for us as a society? Um, what's at stake for us in terms of human development, in terms of our sense of identity, in terms of social functioning? So let me just give you a few examples to think with here about how privacy helps us to be human beings. Um, so maybe if you've hung out with um, toddlers, um, maybe you've seen that moment when the little kid runs in and they have a secret and then they just like spill it in a minute, right? And they're so happy, they're so excited they have that secret and then it's gone. Well, what is that moment about? That moment for that person, that young person, is the moment when they know they know something and they know you don't know it. And there's huge delight in that and also huge recognition in themselves that they have some separateness from, they have some autonomy of knowledge, of self-knowledge. And that is huge to the development of a sense of, sense of self. And then, of course, we um, see that escalated in adolescence. You know, how many of you, I can speak for myself, as an adolescent, I had things that I just neglected to tell my parents. Now, it wasn't that they were such important things, but that process of, again, having a part of your life that you know you know, and these other people from whom you're trying to construct your identity in reaction to, you've been so close to them, one of your key mechanisms is to know those things and not share those things. And that's part of what we mean when we talk about privacy, that ability to withdraw or to control some of that information. But it's not just about um, how we develop ourselves as individuals or construct our own senses of self. It's also about social functioning. How do we all sit down together? We all have such um, different views, things we feel strongly about that may be in conflict, but how do we come together and work together? Well, one of the ways we can do that is by keeping our thoughts to ourselves. So if you're, gonna, if you're in the workplace and you have, if somebody is strongly Republican and somebody is strongly Democratic, you don't have to bring your politics to the table. If you did, you might not be able to keep working. So there's a lot of places in social functioning where the ability to withhold information is really important. And it also works for social repair. You know, if you, there's been a faux pas, something has gone on, one of the ways you can repair is by not continuing to bring that thing forward. So there's a broad spectrum of ways in which we handle privacy, um, and you can witness cross-cultural and familiar differences with respect to privacy, but I think the fundamental question is, what's at stake if we get privacy wrong? It's not so much that there's one right way to do privacy, but if we really do it wrong, what happens to those other things? That's one observation. Now, another thing I want to put on the table is this thought of um, what's trust got to do with it? 
You know, so, so far we're framing this conversation in terms of privacy and security. And it's as if if I want something private, if I want um, to control information, I want to be left alone, something like that, the way that I do it is that I must secure it. Well, security is expensive. There's huge costs to that, to building fences around things. And I want to put out there that that's not the only option. So um, when my daughter was an adolescent, there were lots of little books that she filled with things she wrote about. And they just got left around the house. And she knew that nobody was going to read them, right? So the mechanism there is trust. She had her privacy, but because she lived in a trusted environment. So we can have our privacy sometimes without security by cultivating trust. And so the question is, what happens if we try to construct a society, institutions, organizations, workplaces, schools, families, that primarily use security as a mechanism to protect privacy? What sort of society are we building in that case? And what are the alternatives? What other kinds of societies could be built? What kinds of roles could technology play? What might we engineer to support those other kinds of mechanisms in helping us to realize privacy? Then a third observation. I mean, Yoshi is always bringing emerging technologies to the table. And so, you know, we think about, well, what is really fundamentally changing with respect to technology? Um, and what kinds of considerations do we have? What new considerations? So I just want to call out two. One is that the technology is um, not only the Internet of Things, it's actually starting to reach inside our bodies, and not only our bodies, but into our minds. You know, chips embedded in our brains, the kind of work that Raj Rao and his colleagues are doing here. So autonomous thought and action, as we've previously known it, is at risk, or at least it's changing. You know, think of the implications of that work. Um, Hank raises his arm, he flings it and hits Yoshi in the head, and then we ask, well, who was moving that arm of Hank's? Was it Hank, or did somebody have some chip planted back in his, um, back of his neck, and there's somebody else's thought that actually caused that action. And that will have implications for moral action and how we think about accountability and responsibility, but also for how we think about personal and private thought. And then technology is also reaching further and further across the globe and into space. There's a program the National Science Foundation is discussing called Convergence. And in that program, essentially, we're talking about instrumenting the globe. And that has huge challenges for this ability to be left alone, the kind of solitude that Ryan was talking about. And then um, the fourth thing that I comment I want to make is um, technically about the importance when thinking about these issues to think both about infrastructure and interaction, that the two go hand in hand. The former, the infrastructure that we build, and I mean here really those very low level engineering protocols that we develop, those are the things that enable the latter, what we can build on top, how it is that we structure interaction, and that fundamentally is how we structure human experience. So there's a huge amount at stake here in how we approach these issues of not only privacy, but security and trust and the underlying infrastructure that we're all working on. And with that, I will join my colleagues. <laughs> Thank you, Bacha. Thank you. Um, I, I think there's an exciting opportunity, which I hope we can develop, <laughs> because we have three people who view privacy and security from three different points of view with somewhat uh, different backgrounds. And I'm hoping we can explore that in the conversation. Um, to start with, let's take a, a new technology, which uh, I know Yoshi likes to explore. I mentioned in my introductory comments augmented reality devices. So we're seeing uh, an explosion of new technologies. Uh, Microsoft recently announced HoloLens. You know about Google Glass. There are a number of other things um, where you will be able to view the world through a device that can simultaneously record your experience, uh, both in video and sound and also project onto that view that you have. So identify objects, give you directions, or do other things. And this is going to happen, and it's, it's changing the world. So I'm wondering if, from kind of your different points of view, how you think about 
augmented reality and what the, what the issues are, the opportunities, or the problems. Yoshi, why don't yeah, you Yeah, sure, I'm going to start. <laughs> uh, so Hank did actually a very good summary uh, about these augmented reality technologies. I think one of the things that, you know, it kind of came as a surprise to me until I started looking at the space a little bit more is how quickly these things are coming. Uh, and again, as Hank said, these are technologies that might have continuous ability to sense the world. Uh, and by sense the world, meaning take images or cameras or take pictures of the world or also record audio of the world and then process that in some way and then after processing that, overlay some information on your visual display. Uh, and so some of the canonical examples that people in the augmented reality community are looking at is uh, the ability for you wear some technology and as you walk into an environment, uh, it recognizes the people in the room and then puts their name underneath, underneath their face and reminds you about the last time that you talked with them. Uh, so you never have this awkward situation again about saying, I think I know you, but I'm not quite sure when did we meet last. <laughs> uh, and uh, Francie Rosner and I at, at the UW, uh, in collaboration with Microsoft Research uh, and with our students, we're really trying to understand uh, what the future of this augmented reality technology might be and how can we design these technologies that are, provide appropriate security and privacy uh, capabilities. Uh, how do we define appropriate? Well, that's in collaboration and discussion with Baccio and Ryan. Uh, but I will say, uh, give one other example, Han, the research lab, uh, they came out and reached out to us and wanted us to talk with them about their capability. They're also working on heads-up displays for cars that have the ability to, for example, highlight pedestrians on the road or as you're driving to put actually the street numbers overlaid in front of the houses. Uh, I don't know how much you've noticed it, but I have a very hard time finding the house numbers as I drive. Uh, but to do all this requires cameras. And so how do we figure out the right way to balance privacy for a technology that is just basically continuously getting video images about the world, uh, and then it goes to an app. What does that app do with it? Well, what we want to do is we want to make sure that the app doesn't do bad things with it, meaning doesn't abuse that information stored for blackmail. Uh, you know, imagine bad things. Uh, and so one of the ways we do this is to consider an architecture whereby uh, we have the operating system automatically recognize certain objects within this environment. Uh, and then only pass information about those recognized objects to the application. So for example, an application might only be able to see uh, faces, but nothing else in the environment, and so on. Uh, and we also have a technique we've been working on, again, in collaboration with Microsoft Research, uh, but at UW, also on the world-driven access control, where we try to instrument items in the environment with the ability to kind of express privacy policies. For example, uh, you know, if you walk into a bathroom, Ideally, your heads-up display would stop recording, uh, both for your privacy and the privacy of others. But that's on the technical side. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, I, I said earlier in, in my remarks, or I suggested that, <clears throat> you know, you, you can't really um, get a lot of traction on contemporary problems by reference to any one discipline, right? And so. So you, de you need to bring multiple uh, disciplines together. Um, now, but it turns out uh, that interdisciplinary research is, is very hard, um, in, in part because we're not even speaking the same language with each other. We don't, have this, we don't even mean the same things by the same terms. Um, we're coming from different background assumptions and trainings and, and so forth. Uh, one funny uh, issue that we had really early on is we wrote a paper together and we literally could not figure out the order in which you put the authors because the conventions are different, you know, in the different disciplines. So it's like you signal one thing um, with one order versus another. Um, so one of the things that the Tech Policy Lab wound up having to do is um, come up with a, with a set of processes, with methods, in order to integrate the insights from multiple disciplines. And the first place I think we really did that very successfully was in a white paper that we produced. For those who don't know, a white paper is, a, is a basically a, a kind of a policy uh, audience paper that talks through the policy issues of a particular uh, context or, or technology. We produced this white paper in augmented reality. And we did so according to um, a kind of a method with multiple elements, where at each stage we made sure to get the insights from the um, uh, most plausible discipline. So in order to understand what we're talking about when we're talking about augmented reality, we consulted with the computer scientists. And in order to figure out um, how um, multiple stakeholders, inc including um, uh, 
uh, more diverse stakeholders like those with disabilities or, or, or a low social economic status, we, we worked with the information school in order to do a more qualitative work. And of course, in order to do the policy analysis, we worked with the law school. Um, and so we've come up with this means by which to, by which to do it. And I, I've learned so much uh, through learning about augmented reality. Um, another thing about augmented reality that's sort of unrelated but an observation over the course of it is that you know, augmented reality means you know, different things to different people. Um, and that's something that came across very, very strongly. Uh, in our work. Another thing is the, is the kind of novelty of augmented reality came across. So you know, if you think about it, you know, this display here or this, your, your phone or, or any number of amazing things that, that you interact with all the time, um, you know, display technology has been rapidly advancing and is wondrous. But in a lot of ways, uh, you could draw a kind of straightforward line between cave drawings and <laughs> your computer laptop in the sense that they're both just displaying information external to you, right? Whereas augmented reality, for the first time, blends what's happening with your very reality. And in a, so in a sense, although it is a continuation of previous technologies, um, I've come to appreciate that it's actually, in another way, a real sea change, a real step change. Um, so anyway, I, I found working with, with, the, with the two of you and, and, and others and our students um, to, be, to be really uh, eye-opening. So I, I think what I'll do is just talk a little bit about process. Like, what do you do? How is it that we all come together and work on something like augmented reality? What, is that, what does that look like? And um, one of the things that we do is um, Yoshi and his group will do a really deep technical analysis from the way in which the technical communities are viewing um, a particular emerging technology. So as Yoshi just characterized, the technical community is looking at augmented reality as projecting information, visual, typically visual information, into the environment. And as Ryan observes from the more legal point of view, it's actually fundamentally blurring what you think is real. Um, so if you were to ask somebody, you know, in this thing that you now see in front of you, what's, re what's the real part and what's the projection part, sometimes it's very hard to um, take those apart. One of the things that we also observed is that um, it's often the case that it's people like us um, who end up being the people who are generating these policies. People in DC, um, we have technical backgrounds, we're fairly well educated, you can fill in all the rest of that gap. And yet these technologies and the policies that are um, generated are going to affect um, people who come from very different walks of life, have very different kinds of life experiences. And it's often those people who are put in the position of being reactive to a policy. So, you know, some kind of legislation comes out of DC around augmented reality, around some of these privacy things, and maybe they take into account the life experience of, you know, more mainstream groups. Um, less represented, um, less mainstream groups experience that technology and the way the legislation is. And then they experience another set of harms, the harms that weren't considered from the very beginning. So one of the questions we've been asking is, how could we change that process? How could we surface the worldviews and perspectives on these emerging technologies from different kinds of populations really early stage in the policy development conversation? So that instead of being reactive, those views are proactive. So we've been experimenting with a new uh, method. iSchool PhD student Lasana Magas has been um, running with this. Something we call, um, I think we're calling them diversity panels, but um, we, the name may be changing. But the basic idea is that we identify different kinds of populations and we create a small panel from that population who review um, an early stage um, statement of what the policies might be. And basically, we ask them to tell us what's broken with it from their perspective. You know? And that elicits all kinds of things. So for example, working on the augmented reality white paper, we ran one of these panels um, for people with disabilities. We ran a panel around um, women's issues. And we ran a panel around um, people who are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated. And I'll just give you one, sense, uh, one example of a finding that came out of the disability panel. 
when um, those people were looking at this technology, instead of thinking it's about projecting or augmenting a sense, like it's augmenting my vision, they said, well, for somebody who lacks a sense, it's actually a sense shifter. Well, once you look at it like that, and then we turn to the legal community, that's a different legal language, right? Something else has just happened. So this fascinating thing from how, if we had relied just on our technical understandings and used that, we would you know, go a long distance in writing things in a way that would make it very hard for a certain group of people to get the kinds of legal protections that they might need. I just want to yeah. riff on that, if you don't mind. So yeah. just, to, just to give you a specific example of how policies might change, right? So if, if the idea is that augmented reality is something where you're constantly filming, and so you, could, you, you, you might have a, a policy that says you have to allow people to opt out of being a, a captured by augmented reality in a bathroom or a boardroom, right? That this is a legal right that you have not to be recorded, okay? But if instead it is substituting for another sense, as, as Batya alluded to, um, well then you might have a legal right to use it in much the same way as you have a legal right to bring a service animal into a bar, you see? It completely changes the, who is the rights holder that the law would want to protect. Um, and that was very interesting to us, uh, yeah, sorry. No, that's all good. Yeah. This is good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, I, you, you mentioned Washington, D.C. I know you've uh, had discussions with parts of government, Federal Trade Commission, uh, maybe transportation safety. Um, <laughs> can you talk a little about the kinds of conversations you're having with the government? Um, what are the issues that they're concerned about? What are, what are you telling them? Can you start? Um, well, so we, we've worked with, with the um, Federal Trade Commission um, through the lab. I mean, in a couple of different ways. I mean, uh, I don't, I don't know exactly. I'll, I'll give you, I'll just give you one example, right? So, um, uh, we are uh, going to be hosting a uh, security summit, basically, where the FTC wants to have a conversation with startups about what's adequate uh, in terms of security, and we're going to be hosting that conversation later in the year. One of the things I'm most proud of. Um, in the short history of the lab, which is, you know, we've only been around for two years, maybe two years and a few months, is that one of our lab um, researchers has already graduated and gone to work as a technologist for the Federal Trade Commission. And this is a long-standing goal of a lot of people to actually create a pipeline of technically savvy folks who are willing to, who want to go into government instead of going into industry or academia. And we've already produced one uh, in our short time. You know, so I'm really excited about that. So we're creating a pipeline for talent. We're hosting conversations. M maybe you each want to build on that. But, um, you want yeah, to no, to I the, think that's, yeah. uh, you know, I agree with everything that Ryan said. Uh, Ryan and I were also part of a recent FTC, uh, FTC panel on Internet of Things security. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, so we've been trying to talk with them about, you know, how do security and privacy for future technologies. Uh, one of the things that you can imagine from the summary I gave earlier about the impacts of our discovery, so vulnerabilities in children's toys, uh, vulnerabilities in cars. Uh, and one thing I did not talk about was discovery of uh, software security risks with uh, medical devices, uh, so insulin pumps and pacemakers and so on. Uh, you know, for those with those types of technologies, I do think that the benefits far outweigh the risk. Uh, and so if there's any medical reason to have one of those technologies, definitely, uh, absolutely, you should, should use them. Uh, but it's important for medical device manufacturers and the government to be thinking about how to improve their security. And so we've had lots of conversations with different parts of the government. Uh, for medical devices, we talked with the FDA. For some of the consumer devices, we've been talking with the FTC. Uh, in the automotive space, uh, the National Highway Transportation and Safety Administration, uh, they set up a cybersecurity test lab uh, with cybersecurity evaluation capabilities, specifically in response to the work we did on cars. Uh, and DARPA, uh, one of the funding agencies uh, within the Department of Defense, uh, I guess allocated $60 million or so to try to figure out ways to improve the security of automobiles. So as some examples of our interactions with government. Other, other comments on this? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think, you know, one of the issues for me is that there's a huge community of companies and technologists who are producing products out there who may not really have much background in security or privacy. Um, and also there's pressure, uh, as I said before, to just ship these products to get the products out quickly. Um, how do we change this? How do we both educate those people 
about how to design more secure products or products that are privacy preserving. Um, is that a technical question? Is that a legal question? Um, how, do we, how do we approach that? Well, I, I'm certain it's got to be a multifaceted question, right? <laughs> it's got to come from all of, these, um, all of these different ways. I've been having some interesting conversations um, with some folks at um, Google and actually um, the European community, um, software engineering design community, about ways of changing the design process and ways of um, actually structuring the design process. So think of sort of ISO 9000 kind of standards, but embedding in the processes um, certain kinds of mechanisms <laughs> where you engage with these kinds of values really early on in the design process and carry it through. And then that, of course, um, means that we have to have tools for doing that. We need to have methods. We need to have techniques. We can't just say do it and then you know, leave a big gap there of, well, what exactly do you do? Um, and then we also need to have that, that sense of accountability, right? So if you have a set of methods that we have some confidence in, then if people don't use those methods and things go wrong, then we want to be able to cry negligence. And that's the way in which we use and develop professional standards, I think, in, you know, if we're talking about reliability or we're talking about correctness in systems, we have those same kinds of ways. So I think we can carry that model over to some of these other kinds of um, considerations around privacy, around security, but again, broader values as well. And the, the thing is, these values are often in tension. So I don't think it's just that, well, we definitely want um, security 100%, privacy 100%, and X, Y, and Z fill that in 100%. You know, and live life, we live these complicated lives. So we need some ways in which we can come to reasonable balance. Um, and also recognize that you know, we still do a lot of, um, we are very privileged here, we do a lot of the development of these technologies. You know, here in Seattle, in the Silicon Valley, you know, a few other places, and the rest of the world somehow appropriates what we build. So we need some awareness too that the things we're inventing are going to be appropriated by very different um, cultures, with very different kinds of societies, and so, how do we build things that can be appropriated in ways that are appropriate to those different cultural contexts? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. And so, uh, you know, as part of the University of Washington, as Hank knows, you know, education is, you know, fundamentally important to, to all of us. Uh, and so, I guess I'll give you know, a few remarks. Uh, one is that I kind of want to change the way people think. Uh, and by this, I mean uh, when most people see a new product the very oftentimes the reaction is, oh wait, that's cool, I can't wait to use it. Uh, I wanna change the way people think, so the next time they see a new product, they ask themselves, oh wow, that's cool, I wonder how I could misuse it. Uh, and, that's, and that's the security mindset. Uh, and if we can teach people to think about the world that way, and the, the people that are designing technologies, then they can proactively start to put in defenses and walls to protect against the uh, adversarial activity. I want people to, when they look at those new things, I want them to say, oh, how cool. What's that going to enable for me in terms of human experience? Okay. I don't want them to misuse it. I want them to ask how it could be misused. So it's like maybe just, just as, a, as, a, as a slight clarification. Um, and uh, so one thing that Botch and I worked on a lot, uh, and so I often like to, have time, like to talk about it, which is why, surprise, oh my goodness, it's here, um, <laughs> is uh, Botch and I worked on a brainstorming toolkit uh, that we made. Uh, you know, it's Creative Commons. You can download it. Uh, and we've been shipping it out for free to people that are doing things involved with education. Uh, it's the security cards. It's a brainstorming toolkit. Uh, and I don't know if you want to add more about it. Uh, it has four suits, uh, adversary methods, like how might an adversary try to compromise a system, uh, adversary motivation, so like what might, why might an adversary want to compromise the system, uh, adversary resources, so what, what tools might an adversary use, uh, and then human impacts. And so like, what might be harmed by adversarial action? And we try to be very broad in our thinking about these types of things uh, to get people who are using this brainstorming toolkit to think outside the box about some potential harms. And so for example, emotional well-being, uh, financial well-being, relationships, the biosphere, uh, and just maybe a last minute comment on the biosphere since it relates to our car work. Uh, 
people might have heard that Volkswagen recently got in trouble uh, because <laughs> they are modifying their emission system so that uh, it behaved much differently when it was under test. Uh, if you start reading through these news articles, uh, they actually talk about you know, the actual impact to environment and people's lives as a result of that action. Uh, and so you know, having human impacts, including the biosphere <laughs> and other things, is not unreasonable. I don't know, Bhatti, if you want to you, add. Yoshi gave these out during Halloween to all the children. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I did. And I bet they were thrilled. They were very scared. <laughs> they were very frightened. Like, yeah. Well, I, I want to ask Yoshi another question. Sure. So what do you, we were talking about this earlier, so um, it's not completely out of the blue. But sort of thinking about, you know, how do we, how do we educate, you know, um, students, masters, undergrads, PhD in computer science around security issues, privacy issues 10 years ago. And what are we doing now? Like, are we doing anything different? Um, how are we preparing students to participate in responsible innovation? That's kind of a question I've been wondering about. Like, what do we need to be doing in, in order to, to help promote responsible Yeah, so uh, what are we doing differently and what do we need to be doing? Um, those are, you know. Yeah. Uh, obviously, two slightly different things. Uh, I think one of the things that we're doing differently uh, is that I have seen a maturation over the computer security community over the past uh, 10 years or so uh, to really take more into consideration the people. Uh, you know, by and large, you know, computer security kind of grew out of cryptography, very interest or different parts of the community, but I grew out of cryptography, uh, where we oftentimes think very abstractly and mathematically about a particular problem. Uh, but we really need to think about the people. And so I feel like there's a much more maturation in the community towards understanding uh, the role of uh, the various different stakeholders. Uh, and we see this in the education, uh, and we see this in the, the academic venues that are starting to include explicit references, or we want to see papers that consider security, privacy, uh, and human-computer interaction. Uh, as for what we should be doing, uh, you know, one thing that I've offered in my course, I would love to see more people adopt, is I actually have my students write current event articles in my computer security class. Uh, that, to many of them, when they start this, they're they are reminded of their high school history classes. <laughs> uh, but there's a valuable reason for this, and it's to understand the intersection between technology and policy and computer security and privacy decisions that people might make and on society. So take a current event and understand how might things have been different uh, if security and privacy are implemented in different ways. Uh, or how might things change in response to these current events and the impact with people and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and what, uh, well, just one, th one thing I'm wondering, because I know a lot of people here are, you know, have been engineers in the field for quite a number of years. I wonder what, what you see in the field as change. I mean, do, is there more conversation you know, about responsible innovation or that, that what we should be doing as engineers? Um, as you bring in new engineers, how are they mentored along the line, on, along these lines? So, just very interested in what, as a field, is happening here in, in practice. I, I want to follow up on uh, something you said about things being done here and then shipped to other countries. But then um, we're going to take some questions, and we have some microphones. So after we're done with this, maybe we'll invite people to come down and ask questions. But um, it's true that a lot of technology is produced here. Um, either good technology or bad technology. Um, different, I've lived in a couple of different countries, and every country has a really different viewpoint about what privacy is, about who's responsible for it, uh, about what happens if privacy isn't maintained. Uh, I'm wondering if you can talk about that both from a kind of legal point of view and a technical point of view. Um, and both of those are involved. Um, I know a number of, of companies are struggling with questions about privacy and security that are viewed in a different way by different countries, by different legal systems. Maybe Ryan has some. Well, I can, I can speak to the legal systems. Um, so, so it's actually really interesting. So, uh, there is a, a fundamental tension between the way that the United States regulators tend to look at privacy uh, and the way that, for instance, Europeans do. Um, and people are, people are giggling because it's really stark. And, and it actually has been relatively okay, but it's really come to a head in, in recent years. And so the United States has a famously siloed approach, meaning that uh, privacy laws tend to be um, activity or technology or industry specific. So there might be a set of laws gather, governing health data, but they don't apply more broadly than that, right? Whereas in Europe, um, they have directives that are at the EU level. And then there's some autonomy among the member states, but they have to abide by the directive. 
Um, every member state of the EU has to have a, um, a, a data protection authority. And we never had a data protection authority. Recently, the Federal Trade Commission was sort of like, yeah, yeah, you guys can be a data protection authority because they're doing a lot of protection work. <laughs> but they're not really that, right? Um, and so there's been this sort of tension. But it's been basically OK, because you know maybe companies do things a little differently when they're in Europe, maybe that. But recently, there's been some like real tension. So for example, um, a court uh, obligated US and other companies operating in Europe to enforce the so-called right to be forgotten, which is this idea that you, if you don't, um, if you are embarrassed or, or, or something by, by information about you that's out there, that someone like a search engine like Google would have, to t would have to take it down because you have this right to be forgotten, right? Now that clashes pretty directly with American free speech values because when you um, can't uh, know about something, you can't talk about it, right? And if you can't post something, it's, it's not the kind of thing you, could be, you could do in the United States. That's one example. Another example is that we had this thing that was called the safe harbor, which was this means for US companies to deal with European citizens' data. And they had to kind of check off certain boxes. But recently, a court invalidated the, the, the safe harbor and said, actually, no, um, the United States uh, needs to come up with another way uh, by which to uh, uh, show that it's good enough on privacy for, for Europe. And so they're really at a, at a state of great tension right now. Um, you know, Europe considers this to be a fundamental right. It does it top down. It has these, these institutions in place. The United States less so. Um, now the picture isn't, you might be thinking as many do, that the picture is, well, privacy is great in Europe and it's, it's crappy here, you know? <laughs> and, um, but that's not actually e true either because Europe has not historically been as good at enforcing its laws, you know? So uh, there are some real enforcement gaps in Europe uh, as well. So the United States is sort of like we, we draw fewer lines, but when they're crossed, we're, we're much better about, about, about going after them. So um, uh, you know, that's the legal side in a, in a very you know, nutshell. But um, maybe other people have other views about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a very interesting question. I'm going to give an answer. It's probably not the answer that Hank was expecting when he asked the question, but it relates to some work that we did with Hank. Uh, and it is one of the things that I think a computer security researcher might try to do is try to understand how can we leverage the different uh, political you know, uh, jurisdictions for, uh, for our benefit. And so one of the things that we did uh, on the project I described before about uh, self-destructing data, making sure data doesn't live too far, uh, too far into the future, is can we actually store some bits of this information in different jurisdictions in such a way that it might benefit from the fact that these different jurisdictions have different rules? Hmm. Um, so that's uh, one of the answers uh, to your question. Um, the other thing I would say is that computer security researchers, we really try to figure out uh, what are all the ways that something can go wrong? Uh, just because something can go wrong doesn't mean it will go wrong. So maybe I should also back up and stress that computer security is not a binary. Uh, every system is secure against some adversaries and insecure against others. Uh, and so you know, security and privacy is not a binary. But when thinking about the world and the fact that there's a bunch of different jurisdictions uh, trying to understand you know, how, how, they, how things can go wrong in them. Yeah, and I, I guess I come at this, you know, looking at something like um, privacy from a cross-cultural perspective. No, if you go back and look at all of these ethnographies that have been done in cultures across the world, in really fascinating ways, you see there are, within almost every society, a way in which people can withdraw from society at some point, to be left alone. Right? And in some societies, um, you might signal that if you wear veils or something by raising the veil. In other societies, like we have um, in the West, we have um, rooms and lots of rooms, so you go in and you close the door. So very different ways in which people signal that, but that basic ability to withdraw from society is there. And then people also have different ideas about what is it that you need to um, keep to yourself or control. You know, so in some societies, it's financial information. and in other societies, just think financial information is transparent. It's all out there. It's something else. Um, so I think it's really, this goes back to maybe the comment I made before about the importance of infrastructure 
and interaction and the relationship. It's really important that at the level of infrastructure, we engineer things so that as you move from society to society and you build the interaction models in those different societies, you can reach down into, the infra into that infrastructure and actually enable those different kinds of things. And if we aren't really thoughtful about um, what we build at the infrastructure, then we're going to run into these problems where we just don't have enough flexibility up here. And it's interesting if you've followed the future of inter internet architecture projects that are sort of um, not, they're exploring different kinds of potential architectures for something like the internet. They work with different models for how to handle security and privacy. And they, they would afford different opportunities and often also different liabilities. So this kind of thinking as you're doing your work about, well, if I build it like this and you have all of this diversity here, what am I going to be able to enable and what am I not going to be able to? And, and maybe that's an example of what I mean about um, what are our design processes and our engineering processes? Can we get people really from the beginning thinking about that kind of diversity even when you're doing your you know, much lower level technical work? You know, I think that's a, a, a kind of engineering skill and process that um, could be an interesting way to, to um, push or make progress in the future. Thank you. So um, I'm going to end the panel here. Let's thank our speakers.